turn then in God's Word to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. You can find it on page 1792 in your pew Bible. We'll read the entire chapter. It will be our text for both this afternoon and or this morning and this afternoon. Let us hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Galatians 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You Who attempted to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly await for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the, spirit, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and fallible word. If you'd like, you can keep your Bibles open for a moment. <clears throat> um, because I want to, uh, as we transition, I want to explain something. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we recognize that the Galatian problem is being reiterated here again in Galatians chapter 5. Now, we've looked at this several times, and I want to remind us as we, as we just quickly walk through Galatians of what, indeed, Paul's purpose is to write to the Galatians, because chapter 5 here forms a transition, as it were, in, uh, in, in this letter to the Galatians. First of all, as we are reminded, the problem in Galatia is reminded to 
in chapter 1 already, where we recognize that another gospel, a gospel that included not only the grace of God, but also mixed with works was the only way to be saved. And Paul was very clear that there was only one gospel. And, and we read there in chapter 1, verse 8, that even if another even if we or an angel from heaven would preach any other gospel, one that's mixed with works, type of religion, then let him be accursed. He's very, very convinced that this has nothing, no place in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, he reminds us that it was so important that even he had to withstand Many, uh, some of the disciples, and, and, and Peter himself withstand him to his face, especially when they allowed themselves to be leavened, as it were, by uh, the, this error of the Judaizers. And, and so in chapter 2, he's bringing this bi biographical type of a, um, uh, explanation of, of why this is so important and, and how these people have, have snuck into the church and corrupted the gospel and, and, and to remind them that they need to stand fast in Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, he, he, he clearly tells the Galatians, you are foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you from, from, departing, from, from following the gospel and departing from it that you would not obey the truth? Even as, as, as Christ was clearly set before you, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, he says in verse 3, you are now being made perfect by the flesh. Paul recognizes that they needed to begin this life in the Spirit, by faith, in Jesus Christ, and now that they're being corrupted in, in, by this other gospel that, that included a works type of religion, a flesh type of religion that would never save anyone, he emphasizes and calls them clearly to return uh, to this gospel message. In chapter 4, he reminds them after setting forth before them the, the, the truth of uh, of Jesus Christ and how we are incorporated into the family of God through Jesus Christ, he, he, he pastorally reminds them and admonishes them that he is concerned about them. And you find that in chapter 4, verse 4 through, the, 4 through 20. And, and, and his care for them is, is shown in a, in a beautiful pastoral way that they, that they need to Refrain from going back to these beggarly elements of, of the world that will bring you into bondage and cause you to serve the flesh rather than the gospel. And so he sets before them that analogy that we heard last week at the end of chapter 4 and calling them to cast out the bondwoman, to cast off legalism, and to cast it off and to find hope in the promise of the gospel in the free woman and to stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free through faith, working through love. And that's where we find ourselves in chapter 5. In chapter 5, he reminds them again, and that's why I don't want to go through it all again. I'm just bringing this all back to our, our memory. He reminds them again that if you are going to be circumcised, not that you can't be circumcised, but if you're going to be circumcised, in order to have that as a part of your salvation, then, then you need to keep the whole law because you're in debt to the whole law and you are estranged from Christ and you are estranged from the gospel of grace that comes through Christ. It sets that forth very clearly in, in verses 2 through 4. And he goes on to remind them, not just in way of justification, that you can't be saved through circumcision, but also through sanctification. He's saying, you ran well. You were in the Spirit and you ran well in verse 7. And who, who hindered you from obeying the truth and finding that liberty in the gospel and now taking upon yourself all of these extra works, even not only for justification, but also for in sanctification? 
He says, this is what happens in the church. A little bit of leaven comes in and it leavens the whole lump and it's affecting you. But he has confidence in them. He has confidence in them because of the Lord. And he reminds them that those who have crept in and leavened their church, as it were, that the judgment will come upon them. And so clearly as he set forth the fact that they need to cast out this bondwoman and all of these Judaizers and all of this legalism, he says, I could wish, verse 12, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off because they have no part of this gospel. You have been liberated to walk not according to the flesh, not according to works and a works religion, but you have been liberated to walk in the Spirit. And that's what he's transitioning to. He's transitioning in this passage to say to us that Christ sets us free to walk in the Spirit. The law of the Spirit, we read, is life. And there's freedom in Christ from the law of sin and death. But there's freedom in Christ and in the Spirit to walk in true liberty and life. And so that's what our theme will be for today. Liberty to walk in the Spirit. And we'll take this uh, from the core here of, of um, Galatians 5, really from verse 13 through through the end. But we're going to spend some weeks focusing on what it is that the fruits of the Spirit are. And so as we look at this liberty to walk in the Spirit, we're going to see it in, from a broad perspective. But we're going to back up and see it, see it in the big picture before really diving into the fruit of the Spirit and how that gives us true liberty. Each one of them. So liberty to walk in the Spirit. First of all, we're going to say, see that we are saved to walk in the Spirit. Secondly, in contrast to the bondage of the flesh. And thirdly, and very briefly, to enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. Saved then to walk in the Spirit. We are not saved or set at liberty to give opportunity to the flesh. Paul says. Notice verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. I want to set the record straight, he says. You are not saved and set at liberty to live however your flesh would want you to live and desire to live. That's what liberty is promoted as in, in many, many places today. Because people are, are, are naturally, they want to do what they want to do. And they want to do it whenever, wherever, however, and unto whomever they please. So therefore, freedom then means in a certain sense that, that I can do what I desire to do. We find that, I just used an illustration from the world, from a secular humanist magazine called Free Inquiry, where it's quoted, some ideas can enslave you. Some ideas can enslave you. And some can set you free. If you crave freedom, then you must denounce a baseless dogma. So he says, if you want to think of yourself well, you need to renounce tradition, authority, and blind faith. You need to put away religion, despair, and guilt, and sin. And you need to find a new meaning and joy in life. Well, as a matter of fact, there's some truth to it. And yet... And that's why many 
Christians have even imbibed this type of liberty, and they would be called antinomians. A liberty to now live as we would like because we are now free from despair and guilt and sin. We are re free from a, a works religion and so now we can just li live however we would like and, and, and according to our own flesh even. Who don't judge me type of an attitude. Which is actually not a lot different than these secular humanists. And yet, a secular humanist would not want to follow God because they, they believe that religion itself and Christianity itself is enslaving. And an antinomian wouldn't want to, want to follow God exclusively because then walking in the Spirit is even enslaving. And according, according to his law, out of a relationship with God. But this kind of liberty, says Paul, is not a liberty in the sense of being liberated from religion. It's not being liberated from, 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 from the law in a certain sense. But it's, it's, it's liberating in this way. It's to liberate myself, as John Stott says, liberating myself from my little self, my silly little self, my own flesh and my own desires in order to live responsibly in love for God and for others. You see, true freedom and true liberty only leads us to a greater servitude, serving God above all and our neighbor as ourself. But on the other hand, we also need to be aware when it comes to that. Because there's so many different gospels that come out of even liberty and and, and another one is a libertarian and liberation type of a theology. And this arises uh, uh, in um, the world today, especially, especially in poor, impoverished, third world countries. Liberation theology uh, ha has really uh, influenced them, but it's also especially influenced uh, America and North America in the, in the, in the past uh, a few years, especially through social justice and um, type of type of liberation, type of theology, and and what this type of theology does is it it, it reminds it, it reminds us in a, in a good way, and I think we need to remember this. We are care, called to serve the poor and serve those and see everyone as created in God's image and, and being image bearers of God. And, and yet they take that to the extreme and say that Christians are only true Christians when they promote social justice and they promote equality and they, and they promote, a, a, promote equality among the caste system, equality among different viewpoints and equality among the poor and, and so on. And, and really, then being a Christian is first and foremost is how we treat others and how we care for the poor and the vulnerable in our society. And I'm not saying there's no, in, that we shouldn't treat the poor in, in, a, in a way that cares for them, loves them. And, and I'm not saying that at all. But this theology usually comes at the expense of the gospel, which is the true bread and it, it, it emphasizes a Marxist theology, or philosophy anyway, which leads to communism and socialism running rampant. And this, this is happening in our day. And at the end of the day, it only becomes another gospel and another works religion. Because in order for you to be a Christian, you have to meet the philosophy of this world, which means that social justice is really the most important thing. Just as a Judaizer says, no, you have to be circumcised. That really is important. And liberation theology only really leads to praying oftentimes on the poor itself. It's, it's, a, it's a very damnable heresy, really. And so this, these aren't the types of liberty that we are being called to. These, these are things that we are saved from in order to truly walk in the Spirit. And the difference from those is that 
The Spirit works an inner liberty in our hearts. A a, a liberty to have a relationship with God. And a relationship with His image bearers. Other people. And it's in opposition to a relationship with ourself and our own flesh. As a matter of fact, when God saves us and we begin to walk in the Spirit, that liberty He gives us is to, first of all, crucify the lusts of the flesh. We are saved from ourselves. We are saved from our own flesh. That's why you read in verse 16. Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You're being saved from your own flesh and from your own wickedness. Because that flesh, it lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit lusts against the flesh. They're contrary to each other. There's like a war going on inside of you. This is Romans 7 all over, where Paul is saying, the good that I know I should be doing, I don't find myself doing, and that which I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am! Who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? Who's going to deliver me from my wicked flesh? That dead old man that's hanging on my back, poisoning me, bringing me to death. Oh, it needs to be crucified, says Paul. That's why we read in verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and the passions and the desires of the flesh. It's a mortification. It's a killing. We're we're saved from that. We're saved from our flesh. Because the Spirit is in us. Crucified flesh. That's that's a whole different theology than that liberation theology. That's a whole different theology than than liberty to do whatever you'd like. No, it's a liberty inside of us that desires to be in a relationship with God and to be in the smiles and the graces of God. And to do so, the Spirit crucifies our flesh. And He frees us He frees us from the bondage and the curse of the law. Notice in verse 18 as he goes on. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We've labored about this for weeks already. That Christ has set us free from sin. He set us free from the guilt of sin. He has set us free from death. He has set us free from the devil. It's all shown through His suffering on the cross, His resurrection from the dead, His ascension into heaven as He leads captivity captive and He's triumphal over sin and over death and over hell and over the devil. And then, there from the right hand of God, He sends forth His Spirit freely and fully upon this world so that those who are in Christ may then walk in the Spirit. The Spirit of life. To give us a freedom to fight that good fight of faith, to crucify our flesh, and to deliver us into the kingdom of God. We are saved to walk in the Spirit. A Spirit who's been given full fully on the day of Pentecost, who dwells in the hearts and the lives of all who are united to Christ, are saved to walk in Him. And that is a contrast to the bondage of this flesh. I want to see that, especially as we look at verse 19 in our second point. As Paul says, I, I want to show you the difference of walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, cleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also tell you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What a contrast. I think we can see in that first list it only leads to bondage. And the second list leads to freedom. And when Paul is wanting to set forth the works of the flesh, he's not saying, I want, I want you to know the works of the flesh because all of those out in the world, they, 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 they participate in the works of the flesh, and they do. But he's not writing it for that reason. He's writing it to Christians, to you. And to me, beware, beware of this rotten, deadly, poisonous fruit of the flesh. Because your flesh is still with you. You are not fully delivered into the kingdom of God, body and soul. Yet. There will come a day when this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortal will put on immortality on the second resurrection. But today, in the Christian life, in this warfare, you've got to remember that the works of the flesh are going to creep into our hearts and to our lives. I want to show you its deadliness. And, be, and I want to remind you that that those who practice or those who desire and those who want to live in it and those who, those who refuse to even consider crucifying it, those who practice these things will never inherit the kingdom of God. And so we need to identify what these fruits of the bondage of the flesh are. And really, I would set before you, there's, there's four categories that Paul is really referring to. This isn't the only place. You can find it many other places in Scripture. A list of those things that keep people out of the kingdom of God. And not necessarily are any one of them exclusive lists, but these four categories are really almost identified in all of them. And the first category is sexual immorality. Adultery. Do not commit adultery. The law is very clear. It's in contrary to God, who is faithful. It's in contrary to God, who has created man and wife, woman for each other, as husbands and wives. Do not commit adultery. The second word he uses there is, is fornication. Don't, don't even let it come into your eyes. The word is in Greek is pornea. Don't even let pornography have a part of your life. And, and young people, I know what's going on in the world. Uh, it's a lot different today than maybe when I was a child. The access to pornography, it's deadly. Be warned. It leads to uncleanness, he says, or impurity. It, it radically changes and corrupts our heart and, and our thoughts, and they only become impure. And so that's why Jesus in Matthew 5 says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If, you, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It'd be better to go into life with one eye or one hand than to go into hell with both. That's how radical we need to consider crucifying immorality. Because it, it doesn't just end in our eye gate or our thoughts or our desires. It works itself out. What's in the heart will boil over and spill out and it will lead to what Paul says is lewdness or immoral behavior, promiscuity, living out those desires is what he's saying. Eager to live out sexual 
immorality. That's where it will lead. Sometimes even unashamedly. Cut it off. Immorality. The second category is idolatry. You think maybe Paul would have began there. Idolatry. But he didn't. I think emphasizing the real impact of sexual immorality itself, but which is nothing less than really idolatry. And idolatry here is reminding us it's, it's about, yes, worshiping God. And there's no other religion that worships the right God But he's not just saying, talking about necessarily false religions out there, but but also on how to worship God rightly. And this is what he's really driving home with these Judaizers. They're they're, they're worshiping God in the wrong way. They've, They've formed another road of salvation other than the gospel. And so they're worshiping God in the wrong way, which is also idolatry. It's heretical. We ought never to, to praise false religions. We ought never to praise heresies. He mentions heresies later, I think, in a different context than the word we're thinking of here. But, but he's mentioning heresies here also, also in idolatry. We, we want to worship the right God, and we want to worship Him in the right way, so we need to flee idolatry, as he says so many times in his epistles. Even John says at the end of his epistle, the most important thing, flee idolatry. Anything that becomes more important than God, anything we desire above God and above walking in the Spirit, And above Christ who who saved us is idolatry. Tied to idolatry, he says, sorcery. A word in Greek is pharmakia. We get the word pharmacy from this word. Pharmacy. The pharmacy, uh, you think, well, why would Paul use this word? Well, in in those days, they would use pharmaceuticals, uh, drugs, uh, to to create hallucinations and to be used for magical uh, purposes. Uh, They'd be mind-altering drugs that would create a euphoria that would give guidance into witchcraft and all sorts of terrible things. Sorcery. Astrology. Um, So many times we don't probably... I hope, young people, that you don't get involved in these areas. Uh, they're, they're, they're deadly. Ouija boards and the like. And, uh, you know, you could go to university or college and, and be, be brought into connection with these, the dark spiritual world in places like this. And, and you need to be warned about that. But even think about the acceptance of astrology or or think about how acceptable it is to receive guidance from man rather than even thinking about getting guidance from God. I I will go to man to find out all the answers without even calling upon the name of the Lord. That, That also becomes a source of sorcery. It's interesting To think about this more in the pharmaceutical line again, it's interesting, one commentator even said, this was referring to uh, the drugs of the occult that would um, have properties that would cause abortions. And so they would turn to these drugs when they needed to be relieved from this responsibility of having children at unwanted times and so on and and turn to these and, and, and denounce God's will for them in their life to have a child and 
and, and to turn to these drugs to have a, an abortion. Does that sound a lot different than what it is today? There's not a lot of things new under the sun, is there? These are works of the flesh. Man becomes all important. Our happiness becomes all important. And God becomes nothing. This is the work of the flesh. Idolatry. Sorcery. He goes on to a whole list of, what am I going to title, relational sins. Hatred. Begins with hatred. I'm not going to take them in order, but I, w- I, want to see a pr- I want you to see a progression of what happens. We, we, have a, we, we, we don't have a love for God. That means we hate God. And, and we, we, we don't have a love for our neighbor, which also means we're hating God and his image bearer. And, and it creates contentions in our heart and in our relationships, leading to what Paul calls dissensions, where people dissent from the norm and dissent from their, uh, the family, creating factions, or that, that's really the word for heresies there, heresies or factions, different, different factions. And this is kind of what was happening in, in, in Galatia, wasn't it? I had a hatred for the gospel. They came in with this works religion. You, you need to be saved also through circumcision. And, and, and they created contention in the church, always striving against what is pure and right. And, and, and this dissension formed a, a, a following. And it became then a faction of the church. And, and, and they were better than the others who, who weren't circumcised. There's a, a development in these opposing groups and it, it only creates all kinds of challenges in the church or in families or in relationships. This hatred, he's going on to say, is creating a, a jealousy and an envy for others. And, 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 and all of a sudden that jealousy and envy, that hatred, jealousy, envy, and all of that builds and builds until you burst out in wrath and anger even leading to murder. These are all relational sins. It's really found in Genesis 4 as we had the opportunity to meditate at, at Rehoboth in this week at chapel where Cain and Abel were born to Adam and Eve. And Cain developed this, this hatred for the ways of God and so his, his, his sacrifices weren't accepted. And then he becomes jealous and envious of Abel whose sacrifices were accepted by God. It created contention between them. And the two factions were Cain and Abel. And the more jealous he became of Abel, the more envious he became of Abel. And, and one day in the field when opportunity arose, he out, the outburst of wrath led to murder where he killed his brother. Nothing new under the sun. It's the work of the flesh. How are we doing also in our own church? Can we apply these things to ourselves? Because these relational sins damage families, churches, societies. Workplaces. They're works of the flesh. I want and I will get is its motto. The last category is drunken carousing, as it were. Drunkenness. Now he's not saying... You can never have alcohol or anything like that, but drunken revelries. These are is drunken state. Yes, is sin. It's clear from Noah ready back in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Drunkenness indeed is a sin. But this drunkenness that leads to revelries or what you would call wild, wasteful parties and orgies and everything else. This drunkenness and these revelries 
They only leave you with a hangover and guilt the following day. I couldn't help to think about this past trip we took we took to Iowa and we were on the way back on New Year's Day and we stopped halfway halfway home and we stayed in a motel and we were sitting in the hot tub and this 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 guy was just going off as how much fun they had the night before and and, and how drunk they got and how 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 wild of a party they had and it was it was so great and so that doesn't sound real fun to me. And so you could see he was nursing a terrible hangover. His wife came and then he, he talks about it some more. Wasn't that so great? And I'm just like, that doesn't sound, sound great to me at all. Later on, we were sitting in the sauna for a little while and then, and then uh, we was chatting for a little bit and, and at the end of the day, he says, you know, I value our family and, and our relationship far better than that. You're not having a great day, are you? This kid, his child was in there and broken relationships and so on. And as he goes out, he's telling his wife, you know, oh, those are good people. Those are good people. Those are good people. It's nothing good about us. It's just, it's not appealing. The work of the flesh makes you sick and dead and in bondage. That's the reality. Young people, you think you're going to go out and have fun and enjoy this party and, and, and live it up? I want to tell you from personal experience, I've had friends die doing so. There's consequences. There's consequences for Christians who think they can just continue having one more, two more, three more beers, drinks. Without exercising self-control. I've seen the damage it does in families and marriages with children. It's the work of the flesh that leads to death. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, a joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against these things, there are no laws. These are blessed characteristics. All I'll ask you, because we're going to spend significant time on each of these fruits of the Spirit in the future. All I'm going to ask you now is this. If you're married, and you have a family, and you love your home, and your home life, and your church family, and your workplace, and your society, why wouldn't you want to crucify that rotten, enslaving, damning, poisonous fruit of your flesh? And to live in the enjoyable, pleasant fruit of the Spirit. Because that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. Joy. And the fruit of the Spirit is to be enjoyed in relationship with God, in our lives today, as we enjoy its sweet fruit, while we are being transformed by the Spirit and conformed to the image of Christ. And we don't do it by fruit stapling. 
We don't do it by works. No, we do it by walking in the Spirit. Is that your life? You don't know that you have the Holy Spirit? Jesus says to us today, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, it will be open to you. Because even as our earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to their children, so much more our Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. And then I can only think about how much more our Heavenly Father will give the desire to live in close fellowship with the Holy Spirit as we walk with Him and in Him day by day. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for your work, a complete work of salvation from beginning to end. We give you thanks for your Holy Spirit. And we pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would dwell in us richly. granting unto us everything necessary to enjoy the fruit thereof, to enjoy love and peace and long, being long-suffering and kind and good and faithful and gentle, having self-control. O oh God, be merciful unto us. Deliver us from our old nature. Deliver us from our flesh. That we may more and more live unto you in the fullness of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.